start reading today comes from Matthew. This is chapter 9. We're going to do 9 through 13, and then we're going to jump forward a little bit to 18 through 26. This is Jesus, um, just him being Jesus, doing his day, getting his disciples together, and meeting a bunch of people. Mama. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him, and Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying this, a synagogue leader came and knelt before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she will live. Jesus got up and went with him, and so did his disciples. Just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for twelve years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. When Jesus entered the synagogue leader's house and saw the noisy crowd and people playing pipes, he said, Go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. News of this spread through all that region. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Let us pray. Loving God, open our hearts and our minds to hear and to understand your holy word and to feel the blessings that you place in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> well, I always find it interesting, fascinating, maybe a little humorous, how people are with church. Last week I went to a Baptist church. It was a lovely church. Good time. Great meal. You know, the Baptists can cook, but so can the disciples. That's right. They got nothing on us. But I used to work with someone, and at this job we had to wear all black. And one day, it was a Saturday, and one of our co-workers was getting off work, and she was kind of in a tizzy because she was going to church, but she said, I don't know if I can make it. I might be late. <clears throat> and we said, well, what time does your church start? She had about an hour still before she had to be there. And she said, well, I have to go home and change clothes. And we said, well, you look fine. Why would you go home and change clothes? And she said, well, my shades of black on my clothes are different. My top and my pants aren't the same shade of black. And we said, well, what's that matter? And she said, well, I don't want the people sitting behind me to make fun of me. Well, your co-workers are going to, I can tell you that, <laughs> now that you pointed it out. So, you know, we kind of, of course, gave her a hard time, all in fun, but I think she got the point that maybe um, her church experience was there for the wrong reason. But I always think it's funny how people... You know, we never know. Some people come to church, they want to be dressed up. Some people want to come in jeans and a t-shirt and shorts. Does it really matter? I had someone ask me recently, they said, after you're ordained, will you wear a robe and a stole? I said, probably not. <laughs> never say never, but probably not. Kind of doesn't fit who I am. I'm 4'11", it's just going to look silly. <laughs> and they said to me, well, I think you should. And I said, why? And they said, because then people will respect you. I said, well, I hope that I don't need a robe and a stole for people to respect me. But it also, this whole thought process reminded me of one of my favorite stories. I don't think I've ever shared it with you. But if I have, I'm going to share it again because it's my favorite. There's a story. I don't know where I heard it or who ever told me of a man that decided to visit a church. And so we went to church. Now this man, his clothes were kind of tattered and torn. He was kind of scruffy. 
But he decided he'd go to church, so he went in and he went right down front, sat there and worshiped with the church. Everything was great. When he came out, he you know, introduced himself to the minister, and the minister said, we really enjoyed having you today. We hope you'll come back. And he said, you know, before you come back next week, you might want to put on some different clothes and sort of clean up a little bit. And I said, okay. So we left. We came back the next Sunday and walked in, walked right down front. He had the same tattered and torn clothes on. He had his shape looked the same. He worshiped with everybody, and when they left, he greeted the minister, and the minister said, well, we're really glad you came back. He said, did you not understand what I was saying last week about maybe your appearance or your clothes? And he said, well, I did. He said, but I was a little confused. So he said, I decided I would talk to God and ask God about what, what he thought I should do. And he said, well, what did God tell you? And he said, well, God said, I don't know. I've never been to that church. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? How our human um, ideas and perceptions sort of take over what we think should happen or not happen, kind of lose our ability to see as Jesus sees. And so in this scripture reading today, Jesus is in Capernaum, sits on the Sea of Galilee. He comes across Matthew. Matthew is a tax collector appointed by the Romans. Tax collectors are not very well liked back in the day. They would collect, go around and collect the taxes from people and they were expected to earn a commission, but the tax collectors would add some additional fees on, charge that to the people, and then they would just keep that as extra money for themselves. So they were really cheating the people. And so the Jewish people did not like the tax collectors very much because of their cheating ways. But Jesus tells Matthew to follow him. Come with him. Come be one of his disciples. <clears throat> so he does what Jesus said. And it doesn't appear that he had any kind of resistance or hesitation. He does as Jesus calls him to do. He walks away from his work. He walks away from life as he knew it. He walked away and he couldn't necessarily go back. If that gig with Jesus doesn't work out, he can't exactly go back to the Romans and say, can I be a tax collector again? But he trusts what Jesus is telling him to do. And so they come together for a meal at Matthew's house. Jesus is there. His other disciples are there. There's other tax collectors. There's sinners. The Pharisees don't like it. They don't like anything Jesus does. Maybe they weren't on that guest list for dinner. I don't think they even wanted to be invited because they're asking, why would you eat with sinners and tax collectors? Have you ever thought about that when you go to a meal with someone, your friends, your family? You're having a meal with sinners, right? You probably even invited them to your house. But you're also eating with the same people that Jesus would put on his guest list. And that's a list that I'd rather have than being on the list of the Pharisees. And so Jesus tells the Pharisees, he says, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. In other words, if you're perfect, you don't need me. You don't need Jesus. And the Pharisees, they think, well, that's them. They're not sick. They're not sinners like these other people. That's how they see themselves. That's the sort of the persona that they want to put out for other people to see them. But as we know, there's only been that one perfect person that's ever walk this earth. That's Jesus. And so he tells the Pharisees, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He desires love and relationship with others, not sacrificial things. Sacrificial offerings and rituals often take our focus away from God and the true meaning of why we're worshiping. And they put it on just that ritual. It takes us away from what God wants of loving and caring for him and for others. And so he tells the Pharisees, I have not come to call the righteous, 
but I've come to call the sinners. Because the sinners need Jesus. They need Jesus to help them. They can't go it alone. They need to walk through life with Jesus leading the way. And Jesus wants to give mercy to the sinners, to give love and help and care to them, to be in relationship with them. And so he calls Matthew, the tax collector, to be his disciple. Now in our Genesis reading today, we heard the story of God calling Abram. Abram was 75 years old, and God tells him to go to a new place, a new home, leave everything you know. God promised him great blessings. Other areas, other nations would also be blessed through Abram because of this first step that he is calling Abram to make. Many people would follow God. Through Abram's descendants, many would come to God, and eventually through his lineage, the world would know Jesus Christ. The first step had to come from Abram. He had to trust God, and he had to walk away from what he knew to a place of promise and blessings, a new life. Perhaps you can relate to God doing something like this in your own life. From time to time, maybe now. When Abram packed up and did as God asked him to do, he didn't know really what a great move he was going to make. He didn't know that Jesus Christ was going to be a descendant and change the world. We know the outcome, and we know to see this one step as a great event in biblical history, a lesson in faith and trusting God in our own lives. But God may be calling you to make that one step someday. That one step that will be seen as an amazing leap of faith. That step out in faith, it may not change the world, it may not change nations, but if it changes something in one person's life, if it inspires the life of just one person, then it's just as important as any of the other steps that we hear about. Because each person on this earth, the ones that were here yesterday, the ones today, the ones tomorrow, are just as important to God as the ones in Abram's time. And so as God appeared to Abram in Shechem, he promised to give the land to Abram's offspring. And so Abram builds an altar to honor God. And then he went to Bethel, and he built an, an altar there to honor God. And as he went along his journey, and God appeared, he would build an altar. And these altars were reminders of his relationship with God. A reminder that God was with him, that God was there. And these altars became a place for worship, a time of prayer. It was a reminder to Abram that he needed God in his life to carry out what God was calling him to do couldn't just take the step. He needed him on the whole journey. He needed to constantly be renewed through worship. So he would build the altars, and when he would leave, it stayed. You know, you can't do all of this, all of life, without God leading every second of it. And being in relationship and being in prayer has to become our habit. We have a lot of other habits. That's a good one to have. We need that habit, and that's what gives you the faith to step out as Abram did, as Matthew did, to take that big step. You know, I think it's interesting, all the different people that came to Jesus. Have you ever thought about what it would look like if Jesus could post sort of a a wall of fame, if you will, a wall of pictures of all the people who have called on him or who he has called to him. I'm sure the Pharisees would have a, an idea of what those people would look like. Maybe even our own society has an idea of how that wall would look, those pictures. But I bet we all might 
might see some surprises in that grouping of pictures. Because through the actions of Jesus, we can see that he wants you to come just as you are. You don't have to have clothes that match or hair that's pretty. You don't have to have a perfect life or even an untroubled heart. Just as you are is good enough for him. He just wants you to come to him, to have faith in him. The synagogue leader came to Jesus for help. His daughter had just died and he wanted Jesus to give her life again. And so he comes to Jesus and he kneels before him and he asks him to bring her to life. Clearly distraught, he wanted Jesus' immediate attention. We've all been there, haven't we? In that prayer life, we just want Jesus to drop everything and fix our problem, fix our request. And so Jesus gets up. And he goes with the man. That had to feel great to him, didn't it? Those quickly answered prayers, those are the best. But then there's a distraction. Of course. Someone else needs Jesus. A woman comes to him. She's desperate for Jesus' healing. She's been bleeding for 12 years. And she comes to this crowd of people. Jesus is there. His disciples are there. The synagogue leader is there might have been a bit intimidating for her. After all, she is a woman in this time, and she would have been considered unclean because of her condition, so people would have avoided her. And she doesn't kneel before Jesus. She's going to just touch the edge of his cloak, and in doing so, she knows if she can just touch that, she'll be healed. It's all she needs, just to touch it. And so she gets close enough and she does. And Jesus, in this crowd, knows that someone needs him. Someone has touched his cloak. And after 12 years of suffering, she's healed. She is a new woman. Because of her faith, Jesus offered her healing. Because of the synagogue leader's faith, Jesus goes to his daughter to bring her back to life. And he gets there, and the people laugh at him, and Jesus doesn't care. Because he knows what's possible. And he goes into the house, and he takes the girl by the hand, and she got up. When her hand met Jesus' hand, she got up. And she didn't go to Jesus. Someone else brought her to him. It's never too late for Jesus. It's never too late for prayers to be answered, for you to introduce someone to Jesus, to have a relationship with him. It's never too late for Jesus to do something in your life, to make a change, to heal, to love. Two very different people came to Jesus in very different ways. And Jesus accepted them both. He loved them both. He answered both their prayers. Not because of how they looked. Not because of the life they had lived or because of any status, but because of their faith in him. That day in Matthew's life, when he listened to Jesus, when he walked away from life as he knew it, he didn't know what was to come. He didn't know that in the year 2023, a church in Wadesville, Indiana, would be talking about him, studying his words, his accounts with Jesus, using his experiences to further their own faith walk. The other tax collectors, the sinners that ate with them, they didn't know what was to come from that. Abram didn't know what the big picture looked like. All the ones that came to Jesus, who asked him to heal their loved one, to cleanse them of their own troubles, they didn't know what that day would look like. They didn't know if Jesus would accept them or turn them away. They stepped out in faith and believed in him. And all the 
of those people came from different places. They had different situations going on. They were all very different. But they had one thing in common. They had faith. Even if they didn't realize it at first. And so we never know who God is using in our circle of friends and family. We don't know who he's using to make a difference, to make a change. It might be you, it might be a friend, it might be a co-worker. We just never really know. But he comes to all walks of life. He looks beyond a person's past and looks into their future. But he meets them right where they are. And that's the amazing thing about Jesus. That's the fascinating thing. We know he's with us. But we never know when he's going to really make his presence visible. When you know that he's there holding your hand. When he's going to bring healing or good news. When he's going to answer that prayer that you've been waiting for for years. Or maybe you just passed that morning. You might be all dressed up waiting for him. You might be covered in dirt from working in the yard. You might be on the highest mountain of your life or strolling in that lonesome valley. You could be sitting in church or doing your grocery shopping. You might be singing someone else's praises or joining in the town gossip. We never know. We know he's there. And he will make himself known in an amazing way. Because that is the amazing God that we serve. A God that will find you and love you just as you are. Amen. And now let's be together in a spirit of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise for showing us another day. Your presence in our lives is the greatest gift. And for that, we give you all the glory. You have taught us to love one another and to love ourselves, but the greatest love we have belongs to you. Our hearts would be nothing without you, and our lives would be empty. Today is different than yesterday, and tomorrow will be different than today, yet you remain the same in us, always loving and kind, with forgiveness available to all if we but come to you and ask. We pray that we will live our lives to be pleasing to you, ready and willing to hear you and to have faith and obey. Lord, there are those among us in our lives that we lift up to you for healing and comfort, for growth and understanding. We pray that you will bless their days and open their hearts to feel your blessings upon them and your presence in their days. We pray for those that cannot be with us this morning but are with us in spirit and in love. And for those days when we feel distant from you, we pray that you will fill us with your spiritual joy. We pray that you will continue to protect us from harm as individuals, as a church, as a community, and as a nation. Remind us, Lord, to be an example of your love, no matter where we are or whom we may encounter. May we be friends to a stranger and a welcoming face to a friend. Lord, hear us now as we lift our prayers, our joys, and our concerns up to you in this time of silent prayer. We lift these prayers to you, our one true God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Please. 